The current administration, I think, has properly characterized that energy storage in some fashion, whether it be with batteries or thermal storage or some new technologies, um, is the only way to get renewables to grow because they're fundamentally an intermittent uh, uh, energy source. Our remaining challenge in an area where I think new technologies are evolving but where our needs are perhaps growing even more rapidly is the ability to mimic that storage. Electricity is a wonderful versatile source. Many of the ways we use energy can be converted from and to electricity fairly efficiently and conveniently. What we've not mastered technologically over time is very efficient and cost-effective ways to store electric energy. Well, I, I, think, I think right now the, the population, the U.S. and the world, is sensitized that we should move away from fossil fuels, but I'm a pragmatist, and I think if the consumer wants to do that, you have to affect the consumer. So I think it comes down to some sort of cost aspect, which really means that if the current administration wants to make a change, we're going to have to see a carbon tax or we're going to have to see some sort of carbon cap and trade. Without that, and prices rising for people to either build something different or transmit something different or use something different, um, we'll be stuck at what we are now, which is about 85 to 87 percent of all our energy is fossil. I think as we move away from fossil fuels, we see ways that we're going to have to try and both mimic that characteristic and, frankly, adapt as a society to different characteristics of energy. So fundamentally, our sources uh, are either to mimic the sun in the form of nuclear energy or to capture solar energy in other forms, and then perhaps at smaller levels, geothermal energy and the like. Uh, my own expertise comes at the problem from the standpoint of the electric power grid. And to me, electricity has really evolved as the lingua franca of energy in the way we use it in our society. And as we try and adapt for more varied sources, and indeed with the sun as our primary source, more variable sources in both time and space, I believe the electric grid will play a more prominent role both in delivering that energy over long distances and ultimately giving us a way to average out our use over big geographic areas. Certainly uh, there are many folks working very hard on both battery technologies and alternative forms of storage, those I think will be a key enabler to letting us, shall we say, substitute electrical forms of energy that might come from a wide variety of primary sources, wind, solar electric, solar thermal, perhaps renewed forms of nuclear energy, and bring those to end uses that historically may have relied more on fossil fuels. Well, right now the mix of energy is uh, Generally speaking, the, the, the mix of energy, as I said, is about like 85% fossil. The other 10% is nuclear for electricity. And then the remaining 5% is essentially hydro with a small, less than a percent of what people think is renewables, which is solar, wind, geothermal, etc. Probably you'll see that less than 1% grow, but unless there's ways to find um, storage of this electricity, or this power because it's intermittent, it's going to be a tough road to hoe. And what we're looking for now is a greater ability to precisely control where power flows. If we move towards storage to redirect energy paths towards storage locations from what may be geographically and time very rapidly time varying sources uh, through the grid in a much more controlled fashion. The historic technology to do that has been power electronics applied predominantly at the industrial level. And I think many of the opportunities that exist for us in the coming years involve both bringing that power electronics control technology up to the higher power levels of the grid and integrating it more effectively with the communication and control technology that has evolved with the internet, with computer networking. Certainly energy intensive in industries have looked to do this fairly aggressively already where the cost savings are large. But I think the opportunities to bring that down to the uh, individual residential customer level are really getting to be very attractive. And we have a unique position here in the college with a range of expertise from the power electronics 
to the distributed networking, to the electric grid itself, and integrating those skill sets will be one of the key enablers that I think we really need to take advantage of here in the college. Well, the, the University of Wisconsin actually is doing a lot um, if you look at the whole campus. Uh, we have what is called the Energy Institute, which is a an overarching center that tries to uh, get researchers, faculty, scientists, staff, working with students and actually working on projects on new areas of energy, not just new energy technologies, but new ways to uh, 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 conserve energy and efficiencies, new ways to essentially look at how people use energy. So the Energy Institute is the big overarching campus initiative. Uh, as part of that, in the College of Engineering, we're doing a lot of work in energy technologies. Um, it can be wide ranging. You're seeing work in power engineering for essentially power transmission of electricity. You see it in new advanced technologies for nuclear. You see it in the chemistry department with material science, in new materials for energy using uh, nano materials or nano technologies with novel materials. It's a wide range of things. New combustion uh, techniques because eventually we still will use fossil and we want to have higher efficiency devices so we let, use less fossil fuel. And I, it, I think what we are seeing in many ways is an opportunity created both by the new economic environment and by new technologies that are letting us realize many things that were envisioned in the energy crisis of the late 70s through the early 80s, but frankly fell from the forefront of both funding and technological development as the price of fossil fuels plummeted. Uh, so in particular, this idea of a smart grid, of making the end use customer more responsive in ways that makes the grid and the primary production sources of energy more efficient was an idea that was percolating up in the late 70s uh, under perhaps the less sexy title of homeostatic control within the grid, but very much the concepts of the smart grid without the technologies to make them easily implemented and cost effective. I mean, home networking now to make your appliances respond to signals that the grid might respond is very easily accomplished. We need standards. We need some agreement as to how this can take place in a way that uh, consumer appliance providers can get on board with. But the end use hardware to do it is at a cost of a few dollars an appliance now in a way that would have been 10 times that uh, and physically larger and less efficient in the late 70s and early 80s. So for many of us who chose our career paths at that point in history, it is an exciting time because a lot of things that made one excited about this field at that time got put on the back burner in some ways and now we have the accumulated expertise and technology to really bring it to fruition. Uh, so I'm very hopeful in that sense.